You are listening to the Real Estate Informant Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's another day. Real Estate Informant's Lance Smith, CEO. So today we have two very special guests with us. One good friend of mine, loan officer, one of the strongest in the game, <laughs> Mr. Matt Nieves. Give him a round of applause, please. Where's the sound effects? I don't hear the sound you got to work on that. <laughs> Second is Mr. Angel Colon. Uh, Angel is newer to the real estate industry, but has some personal questions. The reason that we actually even have Matt here today is because Angel, as a consumer and a potential first-time home buyer, has some specific questions in our very last podcast, as well as concerns. So I said, you know what? Let me get my buddy here. The actual mortgage professional who's an, who's a loan officer, like I said, strong in the game, closing lots and lots of loans all across the country. Um, Mr. Nieves, good friend of mine. Of course, I have mortgage experience as well, but Matt is in the industry all day, every day, closing loans left and right. So, gentlemen, Matt, how about you introduce yourself to the people, please? What's going on, everybody? How you doing out there? My name is Matt. Uh, I've been in the industry, mortgage industry, for about six years, banking about 11 years, uh, licensed in about nine states, and uh, I'm keeping them coming, uh, you know, just out here doing what I need to do, informing people and j- dropping knowledge on them about first-time home buyers, refinances, purchasing homes, investments, anything you need to know, I'm here for you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Matt, I got a question for you, right? Because I've been in the industry, you know, 15, 16, 17 years myself. So there's been a drastic change, I'm sure, you've seen between the time that you started. Absolutely. And now, what is the difference you're seeing in your type of client as far as the industry is concerned? What, what, is, what are the biggest differences you see now from what you saw, let's say, six years ago when you started? Absolutely. So uh, when I started in the industry, uh, the purchase market in my eyes, it was just kind of null and void. Mm-hmm. It was more about refinancing, people getting out of those high interest rates when they had them. Um, and now the purchase market is booming. Um, I don't even do any refinances, to be honest with you anymore. A little here, a little there, but it's more about you know dropping the knowledge about purchasing homes, refinancing. Uh, purchasing homes, uh, getting those low interest rates now when you can. Um, you know the, the the market is hot it's right flu- now. Yeah, it's, flu- it's it's fluid. Like a lot of a lot of activity. A lot of activity. Yeah. A lot all of over, all over, not all just over New York. Yes, because I see it in Pennsylvania. I mm-hmm. see it in Georgia. I see it in South Carolina. Mm-hmm. You know, people are wanting to purchase investment properties. Anything they can scoop up, they're mm-hmm. trying to do. So that's why I come in. What is the predominant? What is your predominant loan product right now? Right now, if I'm looking to buy a house, right, and say you have ten buyers. And out of those, give me the percentages of the type of loans that you're actually closing on a daily basis. Give me a percentage of, you know, whether it's investment, then what type of loan. If it's a, you know, first time home purchase, what type of loan is that? If it's a refund, like what does it look like for you? What does a day in the Absolutely. life of the client, your client look like? So well? generally when a first time home buyer comes to me. Uh, we're looking more like FHA. What is an FHA? Uh, Federal Housing Administration loan. That means that, you know, you're not the cream of the crop. This is your first time purchasing a home. You probably don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars in your bank account. I disagree. What's the cream of the crop? Let's get let's get argumentative. What is the what is what would you designate being the cream of the crop? Because just because you're taking advantage of an FHA mortgage, yeah. which is a government federal housing administration government backed mortgage, right? Yeah. The difference between an FHA mortgage and a non FHA mortgage is the government's insuring you. So that's why that PMI is put in place, the mortgage insurance you pay. But you put down three point five percent. People have three point five percent in their bank account. You go non guppy products, you're looking at putting down. 25% or more. So you can still be cream of the crop. You can still have great income. You can still have great credit and yeah. just be a person that doesn't want to put, what, 20% down on a house? Absolutely. Why? To me, that's always a bad... Inv- like, I would never, me personally, I never recommend my first-time home buyers put 20% down on their first Why home be purchase? house rich yes. and cash poor? Exactly. Why? Use someone else's money to exactly. leverage. Exactly. That's what you so, got to do out there. Now, let's go back to that original cream of the crop statement. So, <laughs> the cream of the crop does also acquire FHA mortgages. Yeah. However, if you have more experience 
or you just got tons of money laying around or daddy's giving you a down payment or mom's <laughs> giving you a down payment <laughs> or you know then you might want to put more money down conventional and, and then you'll go yes go conventional lead us into that you bar. know uh conventional borrower they generally have a higher credit score um they generally have a better income less debt uh, they have more. They have, you know, you can purchase a home conventional putting down as low as 5%. Okay, you're losing me again. Let me tell you why you're losing me. Why? When you say a better income, you're not losing me because I know what you mean. But when you say a better income, let's talk to the people that absolutely. don't do this every okay. day. What okay. do you mean by a better income? Give me a few things. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're going we're gonna to lay, we're gonna lay out, right? What we're going to do is we're going to lay out the differences. The major differences. I got my little my little whiteboard jammy here, <laughs> and we're gonna lay out the major differences between FHA, right, and conventional. So let's start here. What is your credit score requirement for FHA? Uh, we can go as low as six hundred. I have done five eighty in the past. Wow. So uh, let's say six hundred is where you know. As low as I would like to go, but okay. you can go 580. Okay. Conventional? Yes. You really want to be 680 and above. Okay. Or higher. The higher, the better, because that's where your interest rates should be taken to effect. Now, when we talk about credit and credit scores, some people, what happens is they'll go to a credit karma and they'll pull their score and they'll see, they'll be super excited because they see two scores. Fake and, news. And I agree. <laughs> that's fake news. Um, they'll see two scores and one may be a 680 and there's such a, a wide gap between the two scores there may be a 680 and then there's a they'll think they can go conventional and then the other score might be a 600 right but the thing about mortgages right mortgage bankers such as yourself what you guys do is you take the median the middle score the, you got to get all three Correct. credit bureaus pulled right so you have Experian, Equifax and TransUnion of the three scores you guys mortgage professionals what you do is you take the middle we take the middle score but yes. when you're going off of a credit karma or something yes. like that yes that's called a consumer report shoot your shot what i know I'm you want to do i know you want to do <laughs> what it. i'm looking at shoot is a financial shot. report so if you yes. tell me hey man i'm good i got a 700 credit score i'm ready to rock and roll that's great you know what your credit score is probably a 680 or lower Dude. Because, <laughs> because on a consumer report your score is always going to be higher than a financial report how can you get financial financial report you give me a call and you let me pull your credit Ooh. and i'll tell you what your financial scores are give them a call got shameless plug matt how do they find you <laughs> how do they find you matt at what maddie's what is it <laughs> uh my phone number i'll give you my phone number sure. I'll, I'll put it out there six three one two seven five eight four eight six again my phone number is six three one two seven five eight four eight six i am available that is my cell phone number call me text me i'm available Whatever you, any questions you want. I want questions. I encourage questions. Okay, and just in case you're saving so much money that you can't actually afford to pay Matt to pay your phone bill, so you don't really want to pay Matt or right, call Matt right now because <laughs> your, your phone's cut off or disconnected. Let's give him more information on FHA. Let's give him more information on yeah, conventional. Absolutely. Let's give him more information on credit. Let's give the people what they want. I am the real estate informant. And what we want to do is we want to inform them of exactly what to expect as well as how to go about acquiring a mortgage from Maddie. Absolutely. And then they can text or call you once they have the information because at least they're coming armed yes. right so we got credit score out of the way mm -hmm. middle score fha 600 plus conventional 600 and better fha tell me about uh a lot of people are concerned about interest rates and they'll say if i get an fha mortgage because my credit is lower won't i have a higher interest rate and if i go conventional and i put 20 percent down wouldn't my interest rate be high or be lower because i put more money down is that myth or fact that you, because you put more money down, you'll have a that's, better interest that, rate. That's, that's false, okay. uh, to be honest with you, because your credit score has a lot to do with where you're going to get the rate. Because uh -huh. credit is risk-based. Mm -hmm. You know, rates are risk-based. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they take many fa factors to see if you are fiscally responsible. That is the thing. Are you fiscally responsible? All right, so what is your credit... What is your uh, credit scores? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you have on your credit report? You got foreclosures, you got lates. We need to know about them because mm -hmm. that's going to take a factor. Now, where does your income, your DTI, debt to income ratio lie? Because if you're maxing out on an FHA at, you know, a back end debt to income ratio. Hey, 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 mortgage professional, you're losing us again. Oh. Slow it down for the people in the back. Yeah, okay. So, DTI. <laughs> debt what to income. Debt. I'm gonna, I hope you can read my handwriting, people. I'm riding on an angle. This is the first time I'm actually using this. DTI is called a debt-to-income ratio. So 
Now, if you're going FHA, right, debt to income, explain to me slowly exactly how a debt to income ratio is calculated. How is it calculated? It's calculated by the amount of payments mm -hmm. you have minus what your income is, gross income, not net income. And this is for W2. We'll talk about self-employment at another time. Um, and then we're going to add in what your payment would be for what the mortgage is. Okay. So we want to make sure that you can afford the mortgage. There's a lot of people out there who don't get pre-approved. Mm -hmm. They go out saying I can afford a mortgage, mm -hmm. but they really don't, really don't know what their payment is. Mm -hmm. So they're doing things ass backwards. Mm -hmm. All right. So you need to know what you are before you get pre-approved because you want to know what your payment is. Why are you shopping for a house when you don't even know what payment is? Right. So debt to income, right, is a huge factor. Is huge how, factor. Based, it, your debt to income, and, and what Matt said when he skimmed over, right, I'm going to elaborate a little yeah, bit yeah, further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what he said was what your payments are. So what happens is every single payment that appears on your credit report all of those debts that you have, whether it be student loans or car payments or credit cards. So let's say, for instance, you have, you know, a three hundred dollar uh, car payment and then you have, you know, a hundred dollar credit bill and then a credit um, credit card payment and then another fifty dollar credit card payment. And then you have student loans of one hundred and fifty bucks. Those numbers, once you tally those up, what's that three, four, fifty five I think it's five, fifty, six hundred. Oh my God, three, four, four fifty, and one fifty is six hundred. Okay, so what would happen in that case, right, is you'd have six hundred dollars tallied up, and that would be your. Basically, we have to hit you for that debt. Yes. Now, <clears throat> to elaborate on what you said, <laughs> listen, man, I have student debt. Mm -hmm. I got about a hundred grand, but don't even worry, it's deferred. Mm -hmm. I don't have a payment on that, so we don't have to hit me for that. So Wrong. someone can get a so someone so when someone says to you, I have listen, my student loans are deferred. Yes, I pay 150 bucks. I'm supposed to, but it's deferred. I don't have to pay it right now. So you don't have to hit me for that debt Wrong. in my income ratio. Because false news. Fall another false news. <laughs> and why is that? Because I have to hit you for one percent because we have to take into factor that you are going to eventually make that payment, right? You're yes. going to have to pay that. Yes. It's not just debt that's going to be disappearing. Right. You know, God's not going to come down and just grant you forgiven. Right. You're going to have to pay that. Okay. So we have to take into factor. We're going we're gonna to hit you for 1% mm -hmm. on what that is. 1% okay. of the loan amount. Okay. Now, as far as the debt to income ratios are concerned, what do those ratios look like for an FHA purchaser as opposed to a conventional purchaser? Absolutely. So... I have gone as high as <clears throat> 55 on a back end ratio 55 for FHA for particular clients okay. uh, on conventional case by case basis case, everything, of course. everything is a case by case basis. So what's the you are not the same person as your neighbor. Nobody is a carbon copy loan. Every loan is different. So you can't say my neighbor got a 4.125. I want that. Really? Okay, let me see your criteria to see if you fit because uh, they don't give you a rate based on, hey, I like you, I'm going to give you this. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's based on what you fit. Everything everything is, is risk-based. We have to see what your financial situation is. Everything like that. So based on FHA guidelines, what should your ratios be if you're looking to purchase a home for the very first time and you're an FHA consumer? You can go as high as you know 55% and basically working with Maddie. 55 that's really high that's what that good. means is you know your back end rate like 55 percent of your actual income you can get a bigger bang for your buck on fha because yeah, conventional exactly. it's a lot lower so you can go you yourself because you're the magic man Ma magic maddie magic maddie can go up to 55 percent right and then conventional what are they looking for what can you go with that we can go with that <sighs> Conventional is a little bit tricky. Um, it could be 47. It could be 49. You know, it's really whatever will actually pass. Uh, so let's say you want to be below 50. You want to be below 50. Okay. So right there, you see the difference between conventional and FHA right this there. Is you qualify more for, for FHA. Maddie, Maddie, 55 and 50? You're giving money away. <laughs> That's damn. I don't want to use the predatory lender. So call brother. me. Damn, you're just call giving, me. You're giving loans away, brother. Call me. Let's see what we can My do for man, you. Maddie, the predatory lender. <laughs> don't come. Don't come. Don't call me for a 580 credit score trying to get 55, though. Got it. That's not. All see? things taken in consideration, yeah. right? How much money you have in the bank. Case what your by reserve, case what your basis. Reserves look like. Okay. So, FHA. 
you know, I got a 600 credit score. I'm buying a house for the first time. Um, my debt to income ratio is okay. It, not okay. My debt to it fit well. You fifty five. Well, on a, on a uh, when you have a six hundred credit score, mm-hmm. we're looking at fifty or below. Oh, see, case see? by case so, basis. So let's change it again. See, gave me the sticker number. It's a sticker, but wow. you come inside, it's a little wow. different. So SRP. fifty. <laughs> Fifty's a little more fair. Okay, so. Um, Debt to income ratio we knocked out. Credit score we knocked out. Let's talk about actual down payments, right? Let's talk about. Yeah. Let's give people real numbers. Okay. So if I'm buying a house for three hundred thousand, right, and that's the purchase price. I'm gonna. I don't have much room, so I'm gonna peak p purchase price three hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, right? What is the minimum down payment that I'm expected to come to save and come to the table with when it comes to an FHA mortgage? Three point five. Three and a half percent down on the FHA side. Correct. Uh huh. So three and a half percent. Let's do simple math. You're talking about ten thousand five hundred dollars down is your minimum down payment requirement. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to buy a house. I have nine thousand dollars in the bank. I get a paycheck next week for fifteen hundred. I got my ten five. Can I buy a house now, or or do you need to see more money than that, or is the ten five just does it do it for me? We need to see the money when we're closing. We can't go we'll go to the closing table saying you're getting a paycheck next week. Mm-hmm. If you get a paycheck next week, we'll push the closing and go for another week. Let's talk about the future. Now, is there a situation where you as a bank want to make sure that I actually have more money available to m- even make my first payment? Because if I only got ten five, and I'm banking on my next $1,500 to, uh, to come next week, and that's all the money I got, do you want to see that I have some type of reserve set up or some type of money? Um, we would like to see side. reserves. We like we we ask for everything. We ask for a lot of documentation up front. You know, I want to make sure that you are a qualified buyer. I'm not going to put you out there on the street mm-hmm. with a pre approval with my name on that pre approval if I don't qualify it. Okay. So I'm going to make sure I get all the documents. I'm going to make sure you know you got 401ks. I want to see it. Mm-hmm. I want to see the statements. Mm-hmm. You you got bank statements. Great. Mm-hmm. I want to see it. Where's your money coming from? I want to get employment verification. Okay. I want to get everything. I want to make sure that when you walk out of the door with my pre approval and you hand that to a realtor mm-hmm. and you say I want to put a, an offer in on this house that you're going to close. I asked you a specific question about reserves because I know if I saved $10,500, I wanted to buy my first house. I'm super excited. You as a bank, do you make sure, is it, is it wise to some, for someone to buy a house with their very last money or do you advise that they actually have some type of cushion available in the bank to make that first and maybe I, second payment? I always want you to have cushion in the bank. Okay, awesome. Because the thing is this, what happens if you buy that house? Great. <clears throat> you sign that contract. Great. You move in tomorrow. Great. That water, that water heater breaks. So, let me ask you. Flood your basement. Next question. How much cushion do you consider cushion? How much cushion do I consider How much cushion? cushion? How much cushion do we get for the pushing? How much you pushing for the cushion, Matty? I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like you to have a couple thousand. They say statistically. A couple's two. Yeah. A couple's two. <laughs> a a few. Cost, so three, some like, <laughs> two, you want, what are we doing? I, I, I'd like you to have a, at least a payment or two for your mortgage already in there. Okay, a payment or two. Yes. So, would you rather... I'm looking for the information that you provide. Like, you're yeah. the guy. Yeah. I'm coming to you. Matt, I need good information. I need to know how to do this. I want to succeed. I don't want to fail. I have a cousin who went into foreclosure. I don't want to go through that process. I want to do this right. I have my $10,500 to put down. What do you instruct me to do? How much money do you say to me I need to have as far as that pushing for the cushion so I don't fail? Absolutely. So, if you're afraid about the process and you don't want to be in the same situation as your your cousin, you yes. said, right? Yes. So, what are you gonna do? Let's talk. Let, let's 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 go back and forth here. What are you gonna do to save? Because if, when you buy that house, you're stuck. You, there's no back seat. No, 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 I don't no need help law. saving. I don't need help. I don't need the help saving. I want to know how much. Do- you said one or two payments. Yeah. So you're basically telling me what safer bet would be two. I'm assuming. Two is always better than one. Two is always better than one. So let's say two payments. You're not going to make a mortgage payment when you close the first month anyway. So you're saving right uh, there. Ah, that used to. That's the, see. That's the good old mortgage guy trick. Because depending on what type of the, what time in the month you close, absolutely, that's absolutely true, right? Depending on if you close earlier in the month or later in the month, absolutely. And can give us the psychology or the science behind that. Because depending on when you close, you can actually go. Almost about two, two months, months about without two months. actually paying Absolutely. the payment, depending on I, when I you like actually I like to tell close. them at least one month because I don't want them in their mindset saying, all right, now I got two payments and I'm going to be skipping, so let me go buy that new furniture. And <laughs> I'm not going to tell them that because <laughs> right. you know what? That When they realize it, they just have that money now in their bank account and they're like, ah, 
Now I have extra money. Now I understand people. Now that, I got money saved. That extra month isn't free. It's in, it's in your closing cost. Yes. So whether you got a seller's concession and a seller helped you out with closing, closing costs, costs, that's something we need to talk you about as well. Actually have, you can actually have a, like a reprieve for almost two months depending on when you close. Absolutely. The earlier or the later in the month. What makes sense if I'm buying my house for the first time, if I want that reprieve, does it make sense? I want the reprieve. The seller's giving me a full concession. The seller's, seller's saying, I'm paying all of your closing costs, and it's all packed into one loan. Boom. So I actually don't have to put out of pocket my down payment. Boom. Beginning when of the month. When should I close? In the beginning of beginning the month. Beginning of the month. Okay. Why not? You get the time. Let's say, listen, to close at the beginning of the month, if you're renting or whatever, you get time to move your stuff freely. You get time to, you know, paint. Unpack room by room. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not rushing at the end of the month to move out because ah, I got to be out of here by the 31st. Mm -hmm. You know, we just closed on the 28th. I got to move everything over. We got to mm -hmm. paint. We got to do this. We got to do that. Why am I, why are you going to rush? Okay. You know, there's no reason to rush on this. Buying a home is one of the biggest, uh, uh, biggest investments you're going to do in your life. You want to do it. Keyword. Investment. Yes. <laughs> you want to do it right mm -hmm. and you want to do it in the proper timing. You don't want to rush through it. You don't want to make any mistakes. How long, if I'm looking, I'm asking all the questions for you, Angel. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you chime in in a minute. But if I'm looking to buy a house for the first time, how long should I expect that process to take? What should be my, based on you delivering, right? Absolutely. obviously, whether or not the house I'm buying is vacant, if an investor sold it to me, or I bought it, I bought it from the Joneses and they got to pack up and move. But typically, how long is the process from beginning to end between the time from the time that I get a pre approval and find a house to the time that Maddie is able to deliver me to a closing table so I can get my keys and move in. So when you are, are actually ready to purchase a home, I'm gonna connect you with one of my real estate agents. I have a power team behind me and I have some strong, strong real estate agents out there that know the market, know the field, and they are just like me and they wanna know the client. So they're gonna take about one to three months, three being the longest I've ever seen with one of my power real estate agents, you know, to find a home and then I'm going to close in about 30 days or less. 30 days or less. I close in 30. So I move as quick as the borrower. Let's put it like that. If you take two weeks to get me a piece of paper uh -huh. that I need, uh -huh. you're adding two more weeks to the process. <laughs> got it. So I can expect, if I'm in contract, I got a realtor, found a house, turned the keys, it had a huge pool, stainless steel appliances. There was a pergola in the backyard. There was body spray in the shower. I'm ready. To, <laughs> I'm loving this house, right? Granite countertops. This is the house I want. You better I be leave, inviting me to a party. I call Maddie. <laughs> Maddie says, the realtor says my offer is accepted. I call Maddie. I say, Maddie, I got an offer accepted. I'm in contract. How long till I move in? And your answer will be what? 30 days or less. Awesome. Get me all the paperwork. Let's make days. this work. 30 day closing. Boom. Angel, based on the conversation you hear going back and forth between Maddie and I, right? Because obviously right. Maddie's been doing this six years. Yeah. Awesome guy, professionals. I've closed lots of loans with him and lots of loans with him, right? Oh. Tons of loans with Maddie. <laughs> um, aside from that Me being experienced In the right. industry as well I sell houses I'm a broker I'm an investor I do all of it as well So you This conversation This tennis match Is going back and forth And I see your eyes Going back and, pack, like, back and forth Like a ping pong table <laughs> What type of questions Do you have For Hit yourself me. As well as others Because what's happening Right now is we're, we're giving information To the public To the people And us giving this information Will enlighten someone else On this process Absolutely So you're going to have Very similar questions To someone else Who's actually right. going to Purchase a home For their first time So speak for the people man. And I'm Yeah Well I'm getting to that point Okay Where I'm thinking about Becoming a homeowner Okay, okay. I understand I have to leverage my name Yeah I got to be someone Before you can be someone mm -hmm. And Home ownership is a fast track to do that. Always. As far as getting equity. So I, I get all that. I get all that. And um, I'm just a little concerned about, I'm hearing a lot about the markets. Some people okay. say correction. Some people say recession. And I know everyone thinks they're an expert and maybe we don't know what's going on. Is now the time to get in, involved in purchasing a house or should I be looking for the downturn and to buy it when it's wait cheaper. wait 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 I think you're looking in the wrong direction you're looking at Maddie Maddie's a mortgage guy he's a money guy I'm the real estate guy so look at me when you ask that question because oh. I got the answer for you I got the answer I mean I got the answer too oh oh you got the answer Sway yeah. multiple answers. what's the answer Sway <laughs> you should always what's be the answer Sway because <laughs> I you know they say it's the sign of the times why, outside. So you know? I'm gonna see why how are much you gonna wait five, five, ten years? Why are you gonna wait five, ten years and hoping that the market changes and you're paying rent and you're throwing all that money out the window? Who are you paying when you're paying rent? Who are you paying? Are you paying yourself? No. Who are you paying? 
paying the landlord. Okay, so who's, whose mortgage are you paying? The landlord's mortgage. Okay, and, and what is that landlord doing? Smiling because he thinks that you're not ready. You know, he bought that house 10 years ago when the market was high. Then he bought another house when the market was low, his own house. He rented out that house to you. And guess what? Who's paying his mortgage right now? You are because you're waiting for something to happen in the market to right. correct itself in quotations right. or whatever you're saying. But listen, you buy now. Buy Always buy because buying a home is an investment. It's always going to go up. It's always going to go down. And it's a 20-year cycle on everything. But... You know, what might be a $150,000 house 30 years ago is, you know, it went up to, you know, $500,000 house. Now it's down three hundred dollars instead of keep on going up. It's, oh, you're always going to gain. I don't disagree with you. Mm-hmm. But for my own personal reasons, right. my views of reasoning to buying a home is very different. Um, the reason that I would say buy a home is because you're cementing your future, right? When you're renting and you have a landlord, your future is always slippery because it's always dictated on what that landlord wants to do with the property. So what you don't want is to market the market to spike because as soon as the market spikes, guess who's selling? <laughs> your landlord. Because he was smart enough and had the balls to buy a piece of property. And because the market is spiked, he's putting you on the street. And I gave him the money to buy it. And you gave him the money to buy the new property he's looking to buy. Because he's like, I'm ca- you know what, I'm, ca- I'm cashing out. I'm moving to Boca. I'm buying a boat. And he's chilling because he understood how real estate worked. Now, when I get let, let's backtrack a little bit, right? Let's not even not even from an investor standpoint. Let my core beliefs. Let's get into my core beliefs. Why I believe everyone should own a home. Number one, like I said, foundation, stability. You have a family, right? You're responsible for that family. They're looking towards you as the support system. They're looking towards you for that financial stability. Correct? Right or wrong? Right. Right. Okay. How can you guarantee that? When in fact you can't even guarantee they're going to have not a roof, but that roof over their head. You can guarantee that when you buy a home, right? You can absolutely right. guarantee that. When, let's talk about raising children. If you're expect, and this is a PSA, public service announcement for everyone that has children. Okay, before you buy a car, before you blow your money on stupid shit before you buy designer before you buy gucci (laughs) louis chanel make sure you put your children in a home because i was a product of an unstable home environment moving around because we didn't actually have that control and i know how that felt as a child i know personally how it felt like I don't want to use it. I don't want to be so drastic. Like it feels, I don't want to say homeless, but at the end of the day, you actually really are. Because if you have a child and your landlord is actually dictating when you're moving, then you can't make any promises to your child as to whether or not Jimmy or Johnny across the street will be their friend, riding the bus to school with them, Next year, the sleepovers are over, and they've created a bond. They've created a relationship. Now, you start moving every couple of years because you haven't cemented an actual future for them. They're constantly making new friends because you weren't concerned enough about their well-being to make sure that they came up, that they grew, that they understood what it's like to have those relationships and keep them. So now they're moving around from time to time, making new friends. And that's not fair to the child because I was one of those children, right? I didn't have any of the same friends between, let's say, preschool and high school because we moved around so often. So even if not for yourself, for selfish reasons, you know, whether it be uh, I want to make sure I take full advantage of the market so I want to wait, I want to wait. Little Johnny can't wait. Sarah can't wait. They're banking on you. And if you want to be a responsible parent, mother, father, 
family unit you're trying to raise, then it starts at home. You create, unselfishly, create the environment for your child that they can rely on you to provide for them because it's frightening for them to pick up. Do you know how frightening it is to change schools and make new friends because you were waiting for the market to turn? And believe it or not, silently, they lose faith in you. Because at the end of the day, you're kind of the reason that they're always the new kid in school. Uh-huh. And the new kid always gets picked on. <coughs> and just because you were the most popular person in your last school district, nobody knows you're here. And nobody likes you. <laughs> and they're going to make it hard for you. So if you don't do it for yourself, do it for your children. Period. End. Let's not even, let alone the tax benefits, right? Let alone the fact that you're not paying someone else's mortgage. Do it for the kids. To my core, I feel deeply about that. And that's one of the, like I said, that's one of my core, of my true beliefs that, you know, homeownership is imperative, especially for anyone um, who, who, who's raising children, even more so than a single person. Single person, you can make dumb decisions on your own. But if you have a family and you're raising children, you owe it to them to own a home. Like, save that money. Put those coins away. Own a house for your kids. Not Absolutely. even for you. Don't be selfish. Right? You lived your life. You lived your life. You decided to create offspring. You owe it to them now. And if you say, what's the, what's the most common, what's the most common cliche statement that parents make? I live for my kids. I do it for my kids. I love my kids. I work for my kids. Then Buy a damn house for your kids. <laughs> yeah. Do it for the kids then. In a backyard. <laughs> Let him get, make sure he keeps his friends. Make sure he doesn't have to be that oddball <laughs> out new guy in school doing dumb shit on the playground. Let to be accepted. Sure. Let them hold on to some memories. Exactly. Boom. Boom. Angel. Yeah. So. I don't know what's going on anymore, man. I'm telling you. You know exactly what's going <laughs> on. Man, you guys hit me hard right yeah. there, man. So now, wow. when you want to buy a house? Wow. <sighs> Yesterday. <laughs> I've I've got another I've got another concern. Cool. Okay. All right. Let's go. I've got I got some some friends who are going through foreclosure. Right. And it's tough and I get it. And you know, he's trying to work through it. He's working through it. He's talking to some people. He's, he's working through it. Why does that mostly happen? And, and what can I do besides, you know, staying strong at my job, you know, and, 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 and cons- being consistent and everything. But, you know, I, I could get sick one day or, you know, say um, that again. You can get sick one day. Yeah, I could get sick one oh, day. Oh, so if you're renting, check this out. You're renting. You get sick one day. Yeah. You get sick on the 11th of the month. You right. take two weeks off of work. Because if you're renting, you're usually you know, living paycheck to paycheck. Anyway, right. So every paycheck matters. So you're renting. You get sick on the 11th. You're out of work for two weeks. You miss a check. Okay. Next month comes around. You can't make your rent payment because you were sick. So you don't have the actual financial ability to make your rent payment because you were sick. So now, your landlord hits you with a notice. You know, you're past due. And you're gonna try to you're playing catch up now to get that money, or maybe you're borrowing, whatever the case. Maybe okay. you're borrowing, but you don't you don't pay people back, so no one lends you money. <laughs> okay. Nobody likes you, so no one's gonna lend you the money, or well, nobody has it. All you right. need better friends if nobody has it. So you're unable to make your payment. Now you're playing catch up. Your landlord's giving you a notice saying, if you don't have my money, I'm putting you in the street. And depending on what state you're in, what county you're in, that whole that process can be really short. It can be a really short process. It can be a situation where you don't, um, you're 30 days behind and the eviction process has already started. It can also be a situation where you're two months behind and now you're out. Because you got sick for a couple weeks. You don't have the freedom to get sick or miss a day of work when you're renting. However, (laughs) if you own your home and it's a situation that you fall a little bit behind, your bank will make workout plans with you, right? You won't be immediately a victim. You can do a loan modification because of extenuating circumstances. They'll modify the terms of the loan for you so you can actually catch up. Do you think your your landlord's going to give you a 
modification of your rent payment <laughs> based on I mean more often than not he won't but majority of the time they're, they're not but a financial institution they're going to I mean there's certain parameters they have to go by when they lend you right. money anyway they can't put you on the street immediately right but you have the ability you have more flexibility because you own you can't get sick and rent but you can get sick and work out a mortgage payment you don't have that freedom it's another benefit so you're concerned about if i get <laughs> sick then then if i get sick how am i going to pay my mortgage no you get right. sick how you going to pay your rent <laughs> <laughs> all right Okay. You're selling stuff. You're selling your All flat right. screen TV to catch up. You're selling your bed. You're selling your Jordans. You're selling oh. your Gucci sneakers. You're selling everything. <laughs> On the flip side of that, I'm at this job. I'm doing great. Mm -hmm. The job is going national. Mm -hmm. They're talking about offices all through the United States. Awesome. I and a couple of others are going to, you know, are in the runnings to be able to go to these places. And now I have this home for five years. Mm -hmm. But now I've got to be in either Miami or Arizona or wherever, you know, wherever that career or whatever that 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 new office that that's opening up. What do I do about that home that I bought? You're a business owner now. You've turned into your last landlord. Now you got two options. You Pass can sell, income. make your money and cash out or you turn into the landlord and you collect rent. And as long as you you have positive cash flow, it makes sense. You're making your more. What do I mean by positive cash flow? Say for instance, your mortgage is I don't know two thousand bucks a month, and the rental market dictates twenty five or right. twenty eight hundred. That's all positive outside of you paying your mortgage. That difference that's your pocket money. So that's the best thing that could possibly happen, is you actually uproot, move to another place because now you have an investment property where you live, and you can actually go get you can get another. You're moving out of state. Right. You can get another FHA mortgage on the other house. Another FHA after yes, already it's owned your it. primary residence because now you're moving into another primary residence. And they're going to help me become a businessman. They who? FHA. That's not their intent. However, <laughs> they're not. Their intent. Like, that's, nice that's not their intent, like buddy. Program. That's not How their intent. No, it's not for, for you. It's <laughs> but just at the end of the day, right? <laughs> if, if it was affordable to, if right. you've actually made your payments on time, yeah. And you're literally moving out of state. Yeah. And your job dictates or demands that you move out of state. Correct. And you're looking to buy another property. Of course you can buy another property, FHA. All over. I believe again. the rule is you have to have 200 miles apart. Out of state. There yeah. are no states that yeah. are 200. I mean, we're not talking about like D.C. and Virginia. Right. Because that's the same thing. Right. But that's why I said out of state. If you're out of state. But go ahead, Matt. Give them the parameters. Give them the guidelines. 200 miles apart. For an FHA loan, mm -hmm. you have to already have that one FHA. You have to live in your house for a year. Yeah. So if you're FHA, you live in your house for a year, your job says, I want you to go to Miami. I say, let me visit you. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you can get a house there, okay. FHA. That's more than 200 miles. All right. And you already lived in your current house for, two, for, for a year. You can get an FHA loan. Absolutely. And he's dead serious. You and listen. you can use that rental income now. You can use that to qualify as income to purchase your new home. When you listen, when you listen to a guy that beats the table and looks you in the eye at the same time, he's telling the truth. Wow. <laughs> he's been beating the hell out of my table. When he beats the table and looks you in the eye at the same time, he's sincere. Okay. You can trust what he's saying. <laughs> Proved. I verified. I, I heard I about the, uh, the credit scores. Yes. Yeah. And I was one of those Credit Karma 700 guys mm. right away. I was proud until I found out that that means nothing. Yeah, you're a loser. Oh, no, I'm joking, I'm joking, joking, joking. <laughs> right, I'm teasing, right. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. No, I'm, but the thing about Credit Karma is it's a consumer-based credit report, uh -huh. right? It's not from a financial institution. So how I'm going to lend you money, my parameters are different. For Like, my scoring model is different. I'm the bank. I'm going to lend you money. My scoring model is different than your consumer-based number you come up with. I can't come in with my screenshot. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> nah. Put it right back in your back pocket. <laughs> Social. So, so my, my question was: Is I, I've I've got the credit. Yes. Um, I've got a great job, but thirty percent of my job is provable in salary, and the other seventy percent is that I'm consistent in my in my sales. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting commission. That commission. Mm -hmm. Is you're that paying tricky? Taxes on it? Is no, that, you're paying yeah, so, taxes. Yeah, on I'm it. paying taxes, but how can I prove if I'm gonna, I'm going to keep on? Because uh, you're paying taxes on it. They're going to basically uh, you want to. I I can. I'm let the mortgage guy do you, it. You get right. a W two. 
Right. You've been at a job for more than two years? Yeah. I'm going to average that. I'm going to average what your commission is. First year, okay. second year. First so if your commission was $50,000 the first year and, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a second year. Right. The average of that number is seventy five grand. I'm going to take that seventy five grand, and that'll be a qualifying income. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, that was a deep breath. <laughs> that was a deep breath. Yeah. That sounds like a sigh you know, of relief. When you're in the commission base, you can't prove your income, and you Absolutely. can't. You can't really no, actually, uh, yes, you I can. Guess. Oh, you don't file. You're a non-filer. No, no, no. I file. No, you don't. Apparently, every don't. Year, every year. <laughs> every year. Every year. He looks at the camera. And when I was 14, I, I bagged year. groceries. I filed. <laughs> I filed. Every every nickel. I filed. Every schmeckle. Yeah. So that 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 answers a lot. Um, what seems to be your concern? If I said let's get you pre-approved right now, you're going to tell me. I got to ask the wife. Okay. <laughs> right. And that's perfectly fine because, right. because listen, it's a joint venture. So no, 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 it I is. I get that. So but I she's say leaning in that direction. Let's okay, get her so on the I'm, phone. I'm being leveraged by Absolutely. her as well. So that's why I'm at this. You got to educate her, brother. This is why you need this information. You need this information so you can educate her as well. So she's not, because you came in here nervous, Nelly. Right. Right. And especially because this is a post conversation. This conversation bled. This. We bled into this conversation based on another conversation we had a couple of days ago right. about one of your role models, Grant Cardone. Right. Good so, guy. Right. So one of your role models, Grant <laughs> Cardone. So based on that, that spilled over into a lot of questionings because, oh, here we go. Maddie, you're a supporter of Grant Cardone as well. <coughs> yeah. So I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. When Grant says things like it's foolish to buy a house. Actually, he said. Use the word dumb. This is what, it actually sounded like this. I think it's dumb to buy a house, man. Anybody buy a house is dumb. <laughs> it's the dumbest investment you can make is buying a house. <laughs> That's what he said. And I felt good about my apprehension when he said that. Right. I felt so, no, I felt I felt whew, oof, almost so made a mistake. When you hear a comment like that, yeah. That's being widespread throughout I mean, everything he does is viral, right? So it's it's like it's but a it's wide. easy for him to say that because how many houses does he own? Boom. He doesn't own houses; he owns buildings. He owns buildings, condos. Right. He controls lives, apartment complexes, everything. Right. right, right. So he got it all. So someone who has it all, they can say whatever they want because they already have it. Well, the conversation is different because basically he speaks from a place of, you know, like I I, I used the example the other day, like he's a like giraffe speaking to baby giraffes who want to actually get there. And because it's a situation where a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll ride and die based on what he says. It's just, well, we're, being, we're just bringing clarity to the situation, especially if you're a person who's looking to accumulate and build the wealth and you're looking at someone like that as a role model. You got to start somewhere. Like you can't not own your first piece of property and just go out and buy a 15-unit building because no one's going to lend to you because you have no experience. <laughs> I mean, you can if you're cash rich. Right? Yeah. If, you, if you got tons, you, but if you want an actual loan, Right, and we're talking about leverage, loans, leverage. You're gonna have to like, who buys? Like, why would you buy a 16 unit cash? But you want to want to leverage that. In order but then to you're wasting that, your money. Your, your money's gone, Psh, gone. You spent all your money on that. Use someone else's money. That's why you try to get a loan yes, for that. Yes. Why would you ever liquidate what you have if that's your reserve? Because God forbid something happens and you get sick. What do you have? If you just spent it, you have nothing. Borrow money. Because you'll have that, 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 that pocket. You'll have, you'll have that in the bank. You'll have that wherever you have that. That money, that's your security blanket. You, you have want that a cushion sec- so you can keep on pushing. You want a security blanket. God forbid something happens. Like you said, your friend who went into foreclosure, he bit off more than he can chew. He probably bought his house and put every single penny he had into it. What do you so, mean by that, into it? What do you mean by that, into it? How, like doing work on the house, upgrading It could have been anything. It could have been anything. He could have put in, uh, you know, I don't want, I don't want to put down 3.5%, so all I have is a, 20 th- uh, is a 20%. I'm going to put that all in. All in. I'm going to debate all you. Black. On. What if he just had a bad Maddie, a bad mortgage guy? What if the mortgage guy he went to, he gave. He didn't give him a fixed rate mortgage where his, his payment wasn't stable. What if he gave him an adjustable rate? That could and when be it, it adjusted, he couldn't afford it anymore. That could be. be it. There's a ton of reasons for someone to go into foreclosure. It's not because they spent. I mean, it could be because they actually overspent in the actual property. Because I know people who've actually went out and bought cars as opposed to, and put down payments on new cars yeah. as opposed to paying their payment. I've known people who weren't paying their payments and they actually put pools in the house and they put extensions <laughs> on the house and. 
wow. you know, things happen. You pick up more than you can chew. Yeah, that can happen. So you have to be very conscious about what you do once you attain the first house, your first house for the first time. I would say, you know, for the first year, become acclimated, make those payments, making your own time, make them on time, get used to making those actual payments, get comfortable, get used to owning and writing those checks to the mortgage company every month before you do anything drastic as far as improvements are concerned. Let's let's piggyback off of what you said right there. So. Remember when I said 55% on an FHA? Yes, sir. I don't recommend that because- You don't recommend what? Going 55, maxing oh, out that FHA. Oh, I don't recommend he that. He doesn't want to be a predatory <laughs> lender no, no, anymore. No, no, no. <laughs> He doesn't want to be a predatory lender anymore. No, I'm joking. I'm you teasing. could go there, but usually that's the case that I'm going off the husband's income. The wife works. Mm -hmm. She can't go on the mortgage. Mm -hmm. So there's another set of income yeah, of coming in. Right. There's extenuating circumstances so like I if said. You're Yes. Both part partners, and yes. you're, we're going off of gross income. It's not yes. your net income. It's not what you take home. Yes. So we're going off of gross income on 55%. And that commission we might not be taking into consideration. Maybe, for instance, you started working a commission-based job right. a year and a half ago, so we don't have an entire two years to, to right. count as income. Right. So maybe, you know, 18 months ago, you started this commission-based job, and it's been consistent, but you can't. Work commission for 18 months, you had to have it like at least two years right. with yeah. the bank to count as income. So if Matt sees that there are extension, extension within circumstances that the other income it, on paper, he sees and feels you're going to make your payment because it can be supplemented elsewhere. So maybe, for instance, you're qualifying for the home on your own and your credit score is a 620 and your wife, maybe her credit score was a 540. Yeah. Divorce Boom, there you go. But if her credit That's score a is a 540, yeah. right, and she has great income, Matt couldn't put her on the loan. Right, because but her income's there, and he knows an there's an extenuating circumstance where you guys make the same amount of money. It just so happens that possibly she paid a car, maybe she had an old student loan, maybe right. something popped up, and she can't actually she doesn't qualify credit wise, but income wise, he sees and the underwriter sees that they'll make the payment and it makes sense, and they'll write that loan at a higher debt to income ratio on the back end because there's extenuating circumstances, and that, my friends, is how Maddie predatory lens <laughs> wow. well this is where we get this is where we get into deep conversation this yes. is when you and i would sit right. down we'd have a one-on-one -on -one. Yes. you know we find out exactly everything there is you lay everything out on the table because if you just started your job two years ago you got on in the bank you know i'm looking at your credit report and you have things that were in foreclosure or you got a lot of stuff in collections or whatever the case may be i'm going to say 55 isn't a good idea for you because look at your past history why would you want to do that but if you're like my wife is working off the books she has her own business she's making x y and z we have another set of income coming in so you can qualify for the higher amount but this is when we we find out this is when you and i would have that conversation you know this is where what makes me stand out that a transactional loan officer, because a transactional loan officer takes down the numbers, gives you the pre-approval, and just gives you what you want without explaining what you're getting yourself into. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Next. Question the, for you. Those guys yeah. treat you like the DMV. Hy hypothetically. Absolutely. I got $70,000 in the bank cash. Can I borrow something? That I paid can taxes I borrow, on. Can I borrow something? <laughs> can I borrow a couple of dollars? I, I want to hold some. Seventy. You got 70 G's, Chief? scared. You got 70 G's, Chief? And you haven't bought a house yet? Exactly. Angel, we got to talk. So, But you said that the FHA, I can get, I can, I can put down less. Yeah. Right? Okay. So if I only want to come out of pocket 15K, yeah. I want to keep the rest of that money. Am I still gonna get that discounted percentage? Yeah. Still, oh, even yeah. though I have that money to prove, absolutely, this is not here to help people who. You get a needed? better rate because you have more money in the bank. You have assets. You have a better. The, what do you? This is not a program for people who no. are in it, that need help getting into a house. This no. is for well, everyone. We don't, well, check it out. Like everyone needs help getting into a house because typically. I don't care if you're putting 3.5% down or 20% down. Right. You still need help. If you're not buying cash, you need help. So everyone getting a mortgage needs help. That's okay. why you're getting right. a mortgage, because you need help. Now, needing and wanting is two different things. Right. I need a lot of things. I want a lot more things. So the person who gets the FHA mortgage typically needs it more than the one who goes conventional. But they have the same decision to make. They want to put let more or less money down. It's about leverage. So if you're only putting three and a half percent down, let's say that you in total you got seventy grand and you're only putting fifteen thousand dollars down, you got another fifty five K. Now you got fifty five thousand, first of all. We're flipping a house. That's number one. I'm gonna we're gonna do some hard money. Like we're gonna we're gonna leverage that to flip some houses. But that's another that's another conversation for another day. So if you got fifteen grand to put down 
and that's comfortably that now understand the payment's going to fluctuate based on how much you put down. The more you put down, the lower your payment is. But when you're talking about the difference between, you know, fifteen and twenty thousand dollars, it's not much of a difference. If you put the whole seventy thousand down, right, the payment might look a little more sexy. But I'd rather, especially on my first deal, I'd rather borrow someone else's money and get comfortable, and then based on the market appreciating in my mind, right, knowing that I'm gaining equity, even if it doesn't appreciate fast and I'm not gaining equity as fast, I know my kid's not the new kid in school. You. Yep. This is, again, when we have a conversation and I say, look, A, FHA, B, conventional 5% down, what looks more appealing to you, what's more comfortable for you? You know, again, this is where we get a little bit more in depth about the whys and what do you feel comfortable with? And again, there's no, there's no wrong decision in any of this because you are the person buying the home. I'm not buying the home. So there's no wrong decision. It's what decisions do you want to make on it? Exactly. That's what it's all about. It's all about making the proper decision at the proper time. It's about securing your financial future. It's about you taking that 3.5% and putting it down and securing the home for yourself, your wife, your family, your children, and getting rid of your landlord. You got to fire your landlord. So at the end of the day, great show, guys. Appreciate it. Matty, the mortgage guy, Mr. Matt Nieves, oh. mortgage extraordinaire, <laughs> Angel Cologne. Preach you guys, appreciate you guys coming by. Yeah, appreciate it. Checking Absolutely. on Thank you for having and me. checking out the real estate informant, Mr. Lance Smith. And that'd be me, people. Thanks, boys. A lot Thank of good information today. Thank you. Boom. Talk to you guys soon. Right. The real estate informant. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Informant Podcast. Tune in for a new episode every Thursday. You can find all of our latest episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Real Estate Informant. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Real Estate Informant, for visual episodes of all of our podcasts.